people asked our families to leave their town. And you destroyed our homes. We went into the mines. You set off your bombs and turned everything to ashes. Boom. 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 The Hills Have Eyes is about a family traveling cross country from uh, from Cleveland to get to California. They really wanted to go to California and see the desert on the way and have a bit of an adventure with their family. Big Bob and Ethel Carter are on their 25th wedding anniversary vacation celebration. They've got all of their kids. And we run into a little trouble along the way. get some, some bad directions, end up in the wrong place at the wrong time. Slowly but surely, they realize there are people living in the hills. And slowly but surely, they realize that they're being attacked by these people. And hell ensues, and it's about the family's struggle to survive. The Hills Have Eyes is about a family who goes into another family's territory. This is Alex and Greg's interpretation of Wes's script from 1976. Really, until we met Alex and Gregory, the director and artistic director, we were kind of just floating around with the idea of like, what could we do? How could we retell the story? And we met them for another project. Somehow it came up that we had the rights to Hills Have Eyes and they went nuts and told us that they'd bonded when they were 14 over Hills Have Eyes and they were obsessed with the movie. We were like pinching ourselves, like, wow, we've been watching uh, Wes Craven Holy Picture since like, you know, we were like 10, and, and The Hills of Eyes, this is one of our favorite movies. So Wes asked us to find a new approach, a new take on the material, something like original, something that justify why we are remaking that movie today. So we came back to see Wes and Marian, and uh, we talk about the idea to bring the atomic testing village. That was a uh, way for us to bring something new for the third act. You want to see some big revenge, you know, of the character. And with the idea of the uh, nuclear environment, we can have this uh, new set. For us, it was something very important because shooting in the desert and to make suspense is not so easy. The idea of this uh, test village came like a big opportunity for us to bring all this suspense. With this very simple idea of the nuclear testing background, everything was very clear. And so Wes was very excited and he gave us like the most amazing gift, his trust. You know, we were like set in Paris to write a script and a year after we were on set shooting the movie. What I found exciting was that a young filmmaker of great talent was gonna take this film and run with it. Action! Ah! <laughs> The car crash, the, the trailer and the SUV crash against the rock was a big, big scene because it's not like just an accident. It starts with the, the car driving over the spikes, then losing control, then like zigzagging on the road, then almost like going out of the road and then going back on the road like try to break and at the end crash against the rock. If we include the, the second unit stuff, that scene was made in three days, but it's not even two minutes, it's one minute and something on screen, but it's really, really strong and efficient. We did like half a day to do only one take of the crash and it needs to be perfect. If it's not perfect, we don't have any backup plane. <laughs> Crashing the rock was scary because we didn't know what we we're going to have and we knew that we just got one car. And at the same time, it's not only the accident, but we need to have the trailer and the car in a certain position. So the stunt guy has to crash the vehicle in the rock and at the same time think about the position that we need to have after. So that was a really tricky, tricky scene to do. And Danilo and Franco, the, the two special effect people, were also preparing some stuff to have like some dirt 
and, and smoke coming out of the hood when he hits the rock. They were also with Joseph Nemec, the production designer, they were building the rock. It's not a real rock, it's a rock made of concrete that we built just in front. He has to be strong enough to, to take a 50 miles per hour hit. The trailer itself needs to be rigged with a special system under the trailer, like another wheel, like a small carriot that allowed the trailer to zigzag without turning over. And then for the crash against the rock, and that was only one take. We are preparing the crash of the SUV and the camera against this rock. We are shooting with full camera. One here. One here, one over there, one uh, vertical on this one. When you wake up a day of like doing a huge stunt, you're always a little bit nervous. Only one tech, one opportunity. But what is strange is the people around you, all the crew members, all the producer, all the first assistant director are over nervous. And so you have to pretend you are not nervous because if everyone like start really freaking out, you don't have the shot because everyone's going to go to the, the safe side. So the first AD is going to say, you know what, we should do the scene like maybe 20 miles per hour. So you need to be very calm and keep the, the goal that you have the day before, which is we're going to crash that car against that rock with like a 50 miles per hour speed. You know, I worked with many stunt coordinators before, and Cedric did something just amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, Cedric! They crashed the car in the middle of nowhere and start encountering all these, these weird things, and it turns out that it's these possessed people living in these hills. The title of the movie is The Hills of Eyes, and the hills in the desert, we knew that it was like the lead bad guy in the movie. So we need the most jagged hills, the most chaotic formation of rocks, just to be able to have the most like threatening location around the Carter family when they are like stuck in the middle of nowhere. Since the beginning, Alex and I got in mind Morocco. We knew that we could find this location over there because we shot our first feature film in Morocco. And we knew that we have great technician, great location, and we can do really a lot, lot of stuff. There is like facilities and there is some stage and there is crew members. So everything is here. But first, they say no. Well, the director always wanted to go to Morocco. And Amer as an American, we were afraid of it because of terrorism and everything. So I forced them to scout Mexico, New Mexico, Victorville, and Namibia and Morocco. So we went to Mexico. In the north of Mexico, we found some interesting places, but a lot of vegetation, a lot of greenish stuff. And we wanted something very desolated. Namibia was a flat desert. You know, it was like dunes and the moon landscape which is kind of interesting, but so remote. New Mexico was interesting, but everything was like two hours, three hours from the first city. So they ordered us to go in Morocco, and we showed them that we got exactly the same kind of landscape that you can find in New Mexico. Everything was exactly the same. You know, we, we realized doing the all turn around the world that all the desert have their own style, their own look, their own way to be approached. But if we are doing a movie about like New Mexico, there is only New Mexico or Morocco, which is exactly the same kind of desert attitude. They finally agreed to, to move to Morocco. The great thing about the outbacks of New Mexico is the desolation and the loneliness. And there's a great deal of that offered here in Morocco. And it is, when I first came here, to see a lot of the locations that they had scouted earlier, I was stunned by the similarities. For me, the bridging piece was the gas station. When we were writing the script, we were doing some research for the disformity of the hills people. At the same time, we were doing some research about the gas station that you can find in the desert in the US. We found a lot of reference pictures of junk cars and type of architecture, the well, the, the shape of the gas pump. And we found a picture of a guy who did same bottle trees around his place in the desert. And we use exactly the same kind of ID, you know? This guy is an alcoholic. He's living in his place alone and he's buying booze. These bottle trees are the symbol of all the bottle he drink. So we bring all that to, to Joseph Nemec 
and he designed a gas station, which includes all the details that we love. The gas station set, one of the things there was to, was to continue to let the spaces get smaller as we move deeper and deeper into this guy's psychosis. You know, the, the, the front part was larger, lots of windows more open. And then each layer became a bit deeper and a bit, bit darker in, in the tone and what the set dressing was as well. You know, we were in Morocco, so that was more easy for Joseph to ask the people to build a real building than to create some kind of fake location stuff. And so he really built the place inside and out. And it was so real that people were like on the road stopping to pull gas. It was like just amazingly accurate in all the details. One of the things that I talked with Alex early on was trying to bring as much reality to this as possible so that it seemed more than just a scary film or a horror film and that in, in its own way it told, it told another story. What kind of a place is that? Okay, <laughs> put the weapon down. Put it down, <laughs> easy. Put it down. I did the best I could. I think as real as you can root it in the reality, then there's ultimate compassion that, that comes out of, of what you do. And then it doesn't become just gratuitous. You know, there's not too many instances where you can't find horror in life, you know. And I really think that it's true. The more real it can get, the more scary it will be for the audience. There are like people or something living in those hills. Bobby, listen to me. We're in the middle of nowhere, okay? I'm telling you, there is something going on. We're not alone. All right, stay right there. We are doing a movie about like a family trapped in the middle of the desert, trapped in the middle of the hills, facing something that they don't know and they don't have an idea of how brutal it's going to be. It's about like people trying to, to survive until the next day, you know? So to do a good movie like that, you need to be as real as you can. That's the only rule. The more you are real, the more you will believe in the character, and the more you can then care for them, feel for them, and most of it, you can really be scared for them. Cut! Cut it! Very good. That's exactly the same for the makeup and for the design of the people from the hills. If you have some ketchup, cheesy, prosthetics effect like Toxic Avenger, nobody's going to believe it. So you need to make them so real, even on daylight, even under like the sun, so that you can say, okay, that's not makeup, that's real, disformed people. And that's what Greg Nicotero and all the KNB guys managed to do. <laughs> When we wrote the script, we knew that it was really important to have a scary character for the mutant, and we knew that we couldn't just write mutant, you know, we have to describe them. So we thought about what can be really interesting as a mutant face, you know, and we start to research about radioactive fallout and what this can bring to the human being. Big Brain is exactly based on a picture of like a baby with a huge head. It's awful, it's like when nature takes involved with Maine's bullshit, like experimentation and nuclear stuff, it became like really crazy. Through this document, we figured out what we want to write for each of the mutants and to have the reader of the script able to know how it's going to look. Alex and Gregory had very specific ideas about what they wanted the mutants to look like. So Scott Patton, who's one of our key designers and key uh, art guys, used a program called ZBrush and started designing all the characters digitally in the computer. Fortunately for us, during the entire design phase, there was about a three or four week period where we had the opportunity to not only finish the designs in the computer, but then have our sculptors actually sit down and sculpt full-size maquettes of each of the makeups. That was a huge surprise. They did some real scale sculpture of all the mutants. And we came one day, it was just amazing. I was really moved. I was really like, wow. You know, I was like tears in my eyes. They were like so real. The eyeball, the eyebrow, I mean, everything was perfect. The skin tone, the details in the vein, everything was exactly 
what we wanted to have. And then we took off to Morocco to shoot the movie and they were like still doing all the prosthetic and prepare all the stuff. And they sent us some quick time. And this quick time was just amazing. It, you know, from the CGI image from their computer to the sculpture, to the quick time that they sent with all the makeup made for the first time, it was okay, we were sure that we were making a a very, very scary movie. We are doing the first shot with Pluto tonight. Michael Bellesmith, the actor, is uh, in makeup since three hours now. And it's the scene where he's uh, siphoning all the gas from the SUV. I remember we were like shooting and the first AD came and said, you know, they are like starting the makeup on Pluto. Do you want to come and see? And I said, no, I just, prefer to wait and I want him to, to come on set. So that night he came to do the scene which is cut, but we were not like supposed to shoot it in bright light. The idea was just to get glimpses of his face, glimpses of reflection on his head, and see that it's a deformed guy. That was also the first time that we were shooting with a Hills Dweller. And it was already like a week of shooting without any mutants, any monsters. And we were saying, okay, are we really doing like a normal movie? Action! Yes. Signal. Cut. Cut it. <sighs> I feel much better. We just did our first shot with one of the hills dweller and it's very good, it's very creepy. We just catch some glimpses of this disformed skull and it's the first time that you see Pluto and it works very well. It's very exciting. Michael Belly Smith is giving life to the makeup. The way he moves his mouth, the way he moves his eyes, the way he moves his body, it was like perfect. There are times when you look at him and he's kind of sad looking and you almost sympathize with him. Pluto's a very innocent, uh, childlike character, but incredibly vicious. And you almost want to hug him, but you know, you know you don't want to. <laughs> when he goes on the rage, when he goes through Big Brain's house and destroys everything, there's no way in the world you want to be anywhere near that guy. I think everybody inside wants to unleash that that dark side. It's fun, it's very cathartic. When you, when you get done doing a scene and you're beating the hell out of somebody, of course, you know, movie magic, but still you're doing it and you got all this rage and emotion. It's real, but it's controlled. Man, when you they call cut you and you know you nailed the scene, it is it's just an incredible feeling. Cut it! Fuck yeah! Fuck yeah! You know, I remember the first makeup test we did on Michael Bailey Smith here. To be able to see his expression go from sympathetic to angry, it's a tribute to the makeup guys, and it's certainly, definitely a tribute to him as a performer, to be able to emote and act through the, the prosthetics. And, you know, Lizard's application was almost as complex, and he wasn't even covered in a lot of stuff. Greg Nicotero developed a process, which is a kind of fake Joe that you put as a, as a prosthetic, and part of the fake Joe is something that push your lips up. The dentures would go in and sort of ride on top of his lip. So his dentures actually pushed his lip up and then the acrylic was formed in a way to make it look like there was a big piece of missing skin there. I loved that uh, as an actor to have special effects makeup on and to be transformed. It takes you back to the impulses that brought you into acting to begin with. No! The 
attack of the trailer really starts not only with Big Bob burning but with Lisa going inside the trailer. It's a scene that you can find in the original film but when we were like rewriting it we were like thinking about like doing something that we can do today in 2006 with more CGI, with more like special effect. So the explosion start and you start the shot from Doug and Bobby. The camera go as fast as the camera can until the tree with the flame and everything. So that shot was made with steady cam in real speed, like starting from the trailer, then the steady camera has to cross all the desert, which was like almost like three minutes shot of walking in the desert between the stone, arriving on a tree where Ted Levine playing Big Bob was like tied on the tree and screaming in pain without the flame. And then what we did was to remove all the camera equipment and had CG flame around Big Bob burning. And I think the result is very strong because you really have this kind of like chaotic shot that starts the nightmare. It's really like the start of the attack. So to do Big Bob burning on a tree, it's like, I think we use all the, the possible techniques, like his POV through the flames, we use like a flame bar. You have the, the foreground, the frame, and you see all the Carter family watching him. You have him, his flesh like burning and bubbling. So that's makeup, that's can be doing the makeup on his face and on his arm. And then CG flame add to that. You can see his eyes also becoming white, which is also CGI. And then you have animated dummy that can be can control and it's moving and you just put fire on it and it's really burning and moving in the same time, but it's only one take because when the dummy burn, all the mechanism inside breaks. It's so many different kind of process just to arrive to that scene. No! So the attack of the trailer, we try to bring a lot of different new elements like the breastfeeding, but also the way Ethel is dying. It was a big deal because you have the actress flying in the air and crashing against the furniture. So that means, of course, a stand double. So then you have the cable going through the, the set of the trailer. Three, two, one, go. Yeah. So you have people outside pulling the wire. And as soon as you say action, they are pulling the wire and she crash against the furniture. Action! Three, two, one. So at the end, it's like a lot of organization for one very quick effect. Then, at the end, even if the camera angle not showing everything, you have like the side angle where you have to erase the cable. Stand. Boom. On her. And... The screwdriver is like a retractable uh, screwdriver. That's really one of the oldest gags, you know, in the cinema. Ah! Yep. And, and in the end. Take the time, no pain. Okay, to go. Okay? All right. We had talked about doing a dummy head of her because they wanted a shot behind Lynn so that when you pull the trigger, so that you could see the exit wound, which is just such a brutal ending to that whole sequence. And then on top of it, when Aaron comes in and finds her, and then there's that last sort of convulsion when she's on the floor. Oh, oh God. Oh, it was, uh, it's, it's intense. I mean, it's like that, that really is true horror. Let's clear the good let's morning, clear the set. Good morning. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> I'm great. I'm, I'm so good. We need a great job. Yeah. Hi dear. Good. Yes, I did. Oh, hey. you, Alex. Oh. This movie implies so many uh, gag like the screwdriver, the Ethel flying in the trailer, Vanessa Shaw being shot in the head, 
and the brain flying on, on the mobile. We're going to do some brain and blood splatter on the mobile with the family picture. Senza toccare, no? Ecco fatto. Stiamo facendo uno spruzzo di sangue. Spruzzo di sangue. Dai, camera sbagli! Vanillo, sotto per ici, per ici. Palomba? Sì. Camera speed. Ok, ready? And... Action! Cut! Marvelata on the camera! Each gag means like a lot of different departments involved. Mm. Like the bird being eaten, can be did like a fake bird. It's basically exactly the same bird, same size, feel of blood and guts, and with the head, like it's, it's, like, it's like a bottle. So you, you just have to, to bite the head, and you take off the cap of the bird, and then you can drink the blood. It's, you know, we, we, we could like put them on the market. <laughs> <laughs> as as kind of little bottle. So let, let me just see how that and one feels. And it has a latex trunk hanging off the top of the head. Kind yeah, of if you pull off if you pull off straight, yeah. you're not gonna get as much as if right. you crank you it again? off. I'll just take them like that. <laughs> and then I just put them in there. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only place where I get yeah. traction. Yeah. Well, well that's, that's what I needed. I need that stuff in there. Oh, yeah. You crack it. Let's go, guys. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Pictures up. <laughs> You know, we didn't realize when we were writing that there were so many animals involved in the film, like the two German Shepherds, the two birds in the cage, the lizard on the road, the scorpion on the rock, the raven in the crater, the snakes, which was like delayed. We have the snakes like going through Bobby when he fall in the labyrinth of rock. We had like a rattlesnakes coming towards him that we cut that. The vultures at the end, the flies. <laughs> so thanks God we have a very good second unit. We were like working very hard and Greg was doing a lot of stuff. To, to cover that because it's never easy with animals. When you shoot with animals, it's very, very hard to have what you want, so you always need a lot of time. And it's difficult for a whole crew, you know, to be around just one animal. So we decided to, to split, and I did on my side all the stuff with animals, insects, I mean, like lizards and scorpions, and stuff like this. The lizard was a nightmare. We were supposed to have like a shot of the lizard coming from behind a rock, crossing the road, and then stopping in the middle of the road before the, the car arrived. And Greg and the second unit went like for a whole day like shooting stuff with the lizard, but the lizard under the heat doesn't move. You can train a lizard. <laughs> and then you have like the scorpion. Greg and the second unit managed to, to make that unbelievable shot where the, the scorpion is like running on the rock and then the camera crane towards the, the fence. That was very, very hard to do and they managed to have exactly the scorpion. But to get that, you have like someone like the, the, the animal wrangler like behind the rock, like putting the scorpion and you have like maybe one chance on like 100 to have the scorpion exactly going in the good direction, which is the case. And then the raven in the, the crater, we were like never staying in position. And it was so hard that they were like almost falling for the hit. It was like, it was kind of crazy. And I forgot the most important, which is the pig. We have like a disaster. We lost all the piglets for one scene. And so we were like not able to shoot when Lizard is like going to kill the baby and he's pulling the blanket and you see the piglet. You know, we had to find another pig. It was like a huge deal. Morocco is not like a pig country. It's like, you know, it's Muslims. There is no pig anywhere. <laughs> You know, people say that you have trouble with animals and children. We were in hell with animals, but we have to say that for children it was like a dream. Ruby wasn't a child. Ruby is loyalty. She's 18 years old, even if she looks really young, as the character should be, like 12 years old. But she's, she's an adult. But for the baby and for the children in the village, one of them is from Casablanca, the other one is the daughter of our first assistant director, and she really was, like, amazing. Judy, look, look up. And where she was, little fits in there, just a little that. Okay, okay. Let's have a photo. Yes, okay. But the baby saved us. 
little six months baby girl, she never cried. She was always playing exactly what we were expecting her to play. And her parents were like so cool. Hey. 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 And they were on set with us all the time, having fun. You know, who's going to let a camera crew making the hills of ice using their baby under 100 and 120 degrees heat in the desert with like huge mutants and huge freaks like being around the baby, it's crazy. And they agree because they were like very open, they liked this kind of film. And they were also like the best friend of some, of some people from the crew. So uh, that was like, that was amazing. That's really saved us. I hope she won't have like nightmare or, or even not nightmare, but she will be maybe attracted one day by some kind of disformed people. <laughs> that was maybe some unconscious uh, memory and reminders of, of the Hills of Ice shooting. You write a scene where there is a gun on the baby, but after when you have to shoot that, suddenly, even if there is no bullet in the gun, you know that something's not normal, you know? That you don't want to traumatize a baby for, for the rest of his life. So we are using the real gun on the baby, which is kind of crazy, you know, even as fucked up as we are, but thanks to, to the baby mother, which was with us on set, she was like checking the gun every time and she was saying, yeah, it's okay. As soon as we tried to do the shot, you know, we realized that the baby didn't care at all about the gun. It was like a toy, you know, and he wanted to play with a toy. For a baby, a magnum is not a magnum. It's just a toy, a shiny toy. So she was touching the, <laughs> the gun. So in fact, the difficulty wasn't to put the magnum on her, was to have her not like playing with the gun. <laughs> <laughs> that was like all the challenge. The best movie made are like always the one where finding the good balance between production, special effect and CGI. When it's only CGI, you don't believe it. When it's only special effect, it looks fake. But when it's mixed together, it's amazing. So we knew that for the, the makeup and for the prosthetics, we will have to use both departments. So one was prosthetics and makeup, even if sometimes we use some CG just to, you know, erase some stuff here and there. But we knew also that we wanted to try something on Ruby, the little girl from the hills. We decided to try to have an actress's makeup with dirt and everything, and then with CGI, with Jamison Goey and Resolution, this former head just enough to make her look like a freak, but not too much to make her look like fake. There's a little bit of weird when she first tilts her head, it's a little, yeah, little yeah, weird. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I think, I think because of the, the tracking points they put are all the way out on her cheeks, because you know, if the points are here, you smile, yeah. it moves yeah, a lot. Cool. If they're in here closer, yeah. they're not moving as much. Yeah. You know, so that's what's throwing it off, that's what's pulling her eyes apart a little bit. We decide to have really, really a small disformation, to not see the CG, and to ask to, uh, to the audience, where they found this girl, you know, where she's coming from. You see her face and you don't know if she real, is it makeup, but at the same time, her eyes is bigger, very disturbing. And I think that one of the characters works really, really well. We're gonna be taking her eyes and warping them apart, kind of expanding the bridge of her, her nose and her forehead a bit, and kind of expanding her, her cranium. So before I came out here, I took our actress, Laura Ortiz, who plays Ruby, to a scanning facility called Cyber Effects and did a 3D scan of her forehead. You know, for the most part, it's a two-dimensional effect, you know, uh, just stretching her face. But if she turns her head like this, uh, it's going to give the effect away. So we want to uh, do a transition from a 2D warp into a 3D model so that, you know, we can have her cheekbones looking correct and not you know, kind of preserve this bone structure, you know, that she has. I think effects, as far as creating digital characters, have been pretty transparent as far as being digital characters until now. And what we're doing with her is a lot more subtle than that, where it's a freakiness that defies the human perception of what another human looks like. That, that is a genuine bona fide human and not a, not a wireframe model. We use exactly the same technique on the little girl who say, uh, Mr. Won't You Play With Us? Because the shot was very short, we decided to make it bigger, to have something scary very suddenly, you know. Uh, in the second, as you see the girl, you say, wow, what is that? <laughs> Three, two, one. <laughs> it's not really obvious, but a lot of shots in this movie are made with CG. 
It's using visual effects a little bit more than we have seen in a lot of other horror films. And I think a lot of other horror films have tended to be a little gluttonous about the use of them. And I think this one is using them a little more intelligently. Taking things like Lynn hitting with a frying pan and augmenting the blood a little bit more with visual effects just to give it more of a wallop. <laughs> And then things like like uh, the map paintings, I think, in taking this desert environment and extending it with this town that we're constructing and building a map painting around it, constructing this environment and the craters that we see. It's opening things up, but keeping it very realistic. The explosion was one of these scenes where you are just one tech, and it was, of course, very important to do it well. I mean, that's the end of the movie where our protagonist knows that they uh, survive to this awful experience. Today, at least, we need to explode this trailer, which is very good news. After spending so much time covering all the angle, covering all the action, so much stuff going on around this trailer, because this is really the main location of the movie. And today, to be able to to make it explode is a big relief. And it's kind of moving to see this trailer explode. Even if we're going to next week on stage and make all the scene inside the trailer, but it won't be the same trailer. This trailer was so small, <laughs> so hard to work with. And at the same time, I mean, I'm kind of attached to this heap of shit. <laughs> we got just one take and we managed to do it. It was a great explosion. Action is nothing without music. We had this amazing chance to work with Tom and Andy and they really get exactly what we are looking for, which was a way to reinvent the Western vibe, the New Morricone kind of music in the Sergio Leone Western, kind of once upon a time in the West. This kind of huge orchestral music because of the landscape and because of the open space, but in the same time, something which still like very creepy and scary and ominous with some kind of electronical, very strange sound. And when we arrive in the village, you can really feel the music, you can really hear the electric guitar, and we are really in the Western. The interesting thing with this death village was this uh, creepy environment. You get this feeling that you are now in like in a Twilight Zone episode, you know, and you don't know who is living here, what is going on here, and you get this face of dummies, you know, almost like watching you. The mannequins are very tricky because we were only working with 16 mannequins. And when you watch the movie, you have the feeling that there is like maybe 50 or 60 different ones, but it's always the same, that we dress differently, that we age differently, that we are putting in different position. But everything was based on real footage, on real document about how the US Army tested the nuclear weapon in the 50s, you know, like building different kind of houses just to see the effect of the nuclear blast on the American town. And they were like putting mannequins exactly like that in position, dressing them as human, putting food in the fridge, building the furniture, putting the car on the road, having school bus with kids in it. I mean, everything was made as real as they could just to see the impact of a nuclear bombing in the US. Big Brain is the hills dweller who illustrate the, the, the better the damage of the nuclear fallout on the human being. And you understand that Big Brain, as many of the, the hills people, are just so mad about the, the Carter family and all what they represent. They represent the American culture that just forget about them would just like destroy them, make them what they, they became, and just left. And in that scene, you understand that the Hills people are not only the bad guys, they're also victim. Victim from another like Carter family years and years and years ago who did the, the, the testing in the desert. They're mutant cannibals, you know, like they're, they're pretty evil. And I suppose that they're a victim in one sense of the word, but they're pretty vile, you know? I guess yesterday they shot Papa Jupiter, you know, eating out uh, Ethel's heart, so it's, it's hard to have sympathy for, for them. Eating the heart was absolutely disgusting. It was absolutely disgusting. I was really like, damn, cut it, please. And more than the heart, it was like the piece of meat that he has coming down from his mouth. That was terrible. 
B. Drago, who is the same kind of actor than Michael Bellis Smith. He's the guy who's living the scene. He's not like acting. He's like, okay, you a cannibal, you are eating the heart of like one of your victims, do it. And he's doing it. I'm sure if you ask Billy Drago to kill someone on camera, I will do it. He's amazing. He's one of the best actors for that because he's giving everything. I look at it as anything is possible. It's, this, to me, is the art of the infinite possibility. Even in the scenes where I know I'm going to slit their throat or I'm going to pull their heart out and eat it, I'm trying, in a sense, to do it as gently as possible. Then you just have a relationship with energy flowing back and forth. Like Kathleen, when she's laying there, so I tried to always make the connection with the other actor in the scene so that they know we're one. Billy Drago, when he gets that whole get up and he puts on the energy because he's he really goes into it. He was pretty scary when we were pretending to be dead and was all I could do not to move because he could feel the energy. We use Kathleen Quinlan, the real actresses who play Etel, which was great to have her to do that because, I mean, most of the actresses will just refuse to do that. So you have the real harm of, of Kathleen Quinlan and her, her real head, and you have a fake chest, but you can't make the difference. We cast her chest, and then we did a sculpture of the chest torn open with the ribs exposed, because the idea that, you, that he would have had to crack the sternum and break it and, you know, so we actually built this prosthetic that the sternum was was pulled out and the bones were kind of splayed outward. And we made a, we made a gelatin heart because we needed something that was edible. So we just made it out of gelatin, put fake blood on it, and then he just just chowed down. Actually, it was pretty good. <laughs> actually, it was pretty good, and it did spoil my appetite. Not my. And when I when I mentioned that to somebody, their immediate assumption is, oh, because of the grossness of the situation. But it wasn't that. It's just that I ate so much. I had had my meal. They said, oh, okay, now now we're breaking for lunch. And I said, but I already had my lunch. Mommy. And then it's breakfast time. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> it's breakfast time. <laughs> it takes time to prep the, the shot because you have to be sure that nobody is going to get hurt. It's breakfast time. <laughs> That's my first time going through a window. That's cool, bro. Thank you for letting me do this. To see him crushing this window, you know, with uh, so much violence, it was extraordinary. That fight was four or five days shooting scene. So there's maybe like 50 or 60 different gags in the scene. Three, two, one, I broke. That was great. Not including the action and the fight and the choreography of the fight. It's huge. <laughs> We are in the heart of the fight. Two minutes, we're going to crush. That's all we're told. Here we go, guys.
it in there. There's a metal tube, so it should guide itself. Once you, so you can just put it in. Move the head a little bit to start. Okay. Nice. I think the, the inside Big Brand House is it's the best filmmaking scene that we achieve. I, mean, I think it's really like strong, efficient, scary, different, involving all the different kind of techniques. And uh, I mean, I'm very proud of that scene. So Lizard, he's the one who killed Hethel. He's the one who killed Lynn. He's the one who raped Brenda. So is really the one that Doug wants to kill. We built a character who, who is at the beginning of the movie a kind of very coward, non-violent, that he doesn't like guns. And at the end of the movie, Doug became someone else. To save his baby, he has to become as the bad guys. And so he has to use weapon like the shotgun. To do that, I mean, it means a lot of different elements. It's in between Lizard's stand double and Lizard himself being beat in the face. But that's also where you have some great surprise. One, go! Because Lizard's makeup is a, is a fake Joe applied in his mouth, it lets his lips very open. So you, when you, you put some blood inside the lips, when he's doing some movement like that with his head getting the, the, the blood split naturally on his face. And the result is amazing. You really have the feeling that he has his nose being broken. Oh, 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 fuck. And then you have all the, the different squib for the gunshot. One of them is the regular one in the stomach. You have to wait exactly the good position okay. to have Robert present well the... And I'll feel it, obviously. So when I feel it, I just go lift all my arms, basically, right? Yes. I go... <laughs> and action! <laughs> and... <laughs> good! Got it? Robert, you okay? Contact The shoulder, which is like also the regular squib and the throws. And that's a very nice effect. It's not a squib because you can't put some explosive stuff here. So in fact, you are using a fishing pole and you have like a big makeup that can be designed. At action, a guy is pulling the fishing, the fishing pole and the cup uh, just left the, the wound and blood is starting to, to just spray out. Making the Hills of Ice was a long journey for ourselves also. I mean, the, the time of the writing and then the shooting in the desert and all the techniques involved in the picture and editing and all the visual effects was a long, long, long adventure. But at the end, I'm very, very happy with the movie because it, it was for us, after high tension, the perfect next step just to explore and being able to develop what we try on high tension, just to to go further in the fear, further in the scare, and most of it doing a real survival kind of film.
Well, thank you very much, Jake. All right. Hello. <laughs> <laughs>